Hi, everybody, and uh, welcome to today's uh, session of the Spectral Geometry in the Cloud seminar. Uh, today, we have our own uh, Laura Monk, who will talk to us uh, about uh, results towards an optimal spectral gap uh, for uh, an optimal spectral gap result for random compact hyperbolic surfaces. Laura, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to have a chance to talk about uh, this project uh, at this seminar. Um, so today I'm going to uh, talk about the latest advances in my project with Nalini and Antaraman, uh, where we hope to uh, find uh, optimal bounds for the spectral gap of random surfaces. So this is, um, I'm going to talk about some steps we've made towards our object. Um, okay, so the uh, object I I'm studying uh, is compact hyperbolic surfaces. So they're going to be called X. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at the easiest possible topological situation in the sense that there's no, the surface is oriented, there's no boundary, there's no cusps, it's compact. So it looks like a I can't, unfortunately, I don't think I can point. So it looks like this, this um, uh, little surface I drew here of Jesus free, for instance. And by hyperbolic, I mean that I put a Riemannian metric on it of constant curvature minus one. So in a sense, it's my normalization. The curvature is minus one. And in that case, we have the ghost bonnet formula, which tells us that the area is entirely determined by the genus and is equal to four pi g minus one. So during all this talk, the surfaces I consider are in the large genus limit, which means that G is big, and it corresponds to a large scale limit. It corresponds to the area being large. And the object I want to consider and understand is the spectral gap. So the spectral of the Laplacian is, as you we all know here, probably is a sequence of positive uh, numbers. And so the first value is zero, and it corresponds to constant eigenfunctions. I'm going to call it the trivial eigenvalue because it's always the first eigenvalue and it's kind of a silly one, a simple one. And then the next uh, eigenvalue is lambda one and it's always strictly positive if the surface is connected because there's only one dimension of constant functions on my surface. So, and then the other eigenvalues, perhaps with multiplicities, I'm not going to care about those today. I really only care about the spectral gap, lambda one. And actually, um, lambda one can be very, very small. And it's really easy to see that by creating a surface which is almost disconnected. It has almost two connected components. So this is a very classic example of a dumbbell surface. So it's a surface where we pinch one little geodesic. So here it has a length epsilon and epsilon is small. And this makes X have almost two connected components. And in the limit, actually, X is going to be disconnected when epsilon becomes small. So in a sense, lambda naught is going to have multiplicity two because there's two connected components. In other words, lambda one is going to go to zero when epsilon goes to zero. So we can't really prove a lower bound on lambda one a priori because we have this very easy to construct example of a service with a very small lambda one, arbitrarily small actually. And this example is really the characteristic of surfaces with a small lambda one. Actually, the reason why we care about surfaces with a large lambda one is that being large is equivalent to being well connected. So by that, I mean, it's hard to cut the surface into pieces. Uh, the previous surface was really easy to cut into pieces, uh, but very well connected surfaces are going to be very hard to separate into different connected components. And also you can argue, uh, prove that uh, surfaces with a large lambda one have very good dynamical properties. So there's good mixing times for uh, different um, dynamical systems that you can study on them. And the little heuristic is to look at surfaces with small lambda one. So the example below, and this one has quite bad dynamics. So we know that every hyperbolic surface is chaotic. So we know that if you start a particle somewhere and you let it evolve, is going to end up being everywhere on the whole surface at some point, 
because hyperbolic surfaces are chaotic due to negative curvature. But here in this example, it's actually a bit of a pathological situation because if I start a particle on the left side, it's going to let it stay there for a long time, an abnormally long amount of time because the surface is not very well connected. When lambda one is large, these sort of things can't happen. So things mix actually very well. And the bigger lambda one is, the better things happen. So that's my mo the motivation for proving that lambda one is large. Uh, so there's a limiting factor to that. We can't prove that lambda one is super, super, duper large because um, in the large genus limit, lambda one can never be much bigger than one quarter. And the reason for this one quarter is that the spectrum of the Laplacian on the whole hyperbolic plane, so the hyperbolic plane is the big plane, which has metric of constant curvature minus one, is one quarter. And in the large genus limit, my surfaces are going to become bigger and bigger. And in a sense, they're going to start to have to look a bit like the hyperbolic plane in some places. So for that reason, there's going to have to be some eigenvalues appearing around one quarter because there's some eigenvalues for the hyperbolic plane around one quarter. So when G is large, one quarter is the best we can hope for. So our objective with Nalinian and Taraman is to prove that typically lambda one is close to one quarter. We can't prove that it's always true because there's examples of small lambda ones, but we want to prove that most of the time lambda one is close to one quarter. And in order to do that, what we do is we study random hyperbolic surfaces. So I decided, uh, actually, I think probably for the first time to not talk about our model and not introduce it because it takes quite a while um, and it's not necessarily that enlightening in the context of this talk. But if you want to know more about it, uh, I can make a little advertisement for my gemstone mini course in a month, where I will be explaining quite in depth uh, how to take random hyperbolic surfaces. Uh, but let's just take it as such. Uh, we have a probability measure, PG, which is a nice probability measure, which is kind of a density, a bit like Lebesgue measure on the set of hyperbolic surfaces of genus G. And it's a very natural model, which a lot of people study and is very pretty and has good properties. And the conjecture is that for all epsilon, uh, the probability for lambda one to be bigger than one quarter minus epsilon goes to one in the larger genus limit. So typical surfaces have a spectral gap at least one quarter minus epsilon, and epsilon can be made as small as I want in this statement. And so that's our long-term objective. Uh, and actually, uh, just a word about how a priori a bit difficult this is, is <clears throat> uh, the following observation. Uh, so we, this means we're trying to prove that most surfaces have a spectral gap one quarter minus epsilon, but the existence of surfaces of large genus, of arbitrarily large genus, such that lambda one is bigger than one quarter minus epsilon, was only obtained in 2021, uh, even though it was conjectured in 88. So in the 80s, people thought, well, probably there's, there is at least some surfaces with lambda one close to one quarter when G is large. But uh, even though a lot of people tried to exhibit such surfaces or to prove their existence, uh, it took uh, more than 30 years to find them. And uh, actually, the proof is a probabilistic proof. So probabilities have been working quite well for these questions recently. Uh, another important thing which will kind of appear throughout is that this conjecture is a perfect analogous to a conjecture by Allen in '86 for regular graphs. So here I'm studying hyperbolic surfaces, but if you study regular graphs, which are a discrete, more, much more simple model in some senses, uh, there is exactly the same thing. There's something corresponding to the one quarter, there's something corresponding to the, the trivial eigenvalue, and you can ask exactly the same question. And uh, this was quite a popular conjecture, which a lot of people worked on also. And it was uh, solved by uh, Joel Friedman in 2003 uh, in uh, following like a, some very uh, long and uh, difficult papers. 
Uh, so uh, I'm not going to explain precisely the analogy and everything, but um, a lot of the steps we take uh, are, have some analogous in Friedman's work. So uh, what do we know for now uh, until uh, the paper we're about to release? We know that uh, there was two incremental steps uh, of allowing to get a spectral gap in the large genus limits. The first step, which was already quite uh, impressive, actually, was done by Mirzakani in 2013. And she proved that lambda 1 is typically at least some constant, which is around 0, 0, 2. Uh, 0, 0, 2. Oh, I'm missing a zero there, but a very small constant. But this was already really exciting because it's a uniform thing. It's, it's nothing that doesn't go to zero as g goes to infinity. Um, so it showed that lambda one is not always retracting to zero, that when g goes large, it, there can be some surfaces with the lambda one bounded away from zero. And this was very significantly improved in 2020 uh, by two different teams independently. Uh, Wu Shui in China and Lipnowski and Wright in America. Um, and they both proved that lambda one is greater than 316 minus epsilon for any arbitrarily small epsilon. There's really a very significant jump in the quality of these estimates because they don't use the same techniques. And so the content of, the, of uh, our article, which we will release soon, uh, is uh, the following. So mostly, we develop a method which is has some shares some similarities with Friedman's proof of the Allen conjecture, uh, and so we develop a very precise method to prove this conjecture, and we uh, prove several important key steps which are present in Friedman's work, and we adapt them to the context of hyperbolic surfaces. And by adapt, I don't mean we do the same and it works again. Actually, um, graphs and surfaces are very much alike, but there's very fundamental differences, which means that we really had to develop some new tools to address new difficulties which hadn't been addressed in the context of hyperbolic surfaces yet. So this first article is really a bunch of tools and important steps and a method to solve the conjecture. And we use these tools and, the, and some partial results, which you prove to obtain as a consequence an improvement on the best known spectral gap. We prove that the probability for lambda one to be bigger than two nine minus epsilon uh, goes to one. So two nine is a bit bigger than 316. Uh, so it's uh, an improvement of this bound. And uh, but I insist on the fact that, so we're very excited that we were able to improve the 316th result, but our approach really has as an objective to go all the way to one quarter. It's just, there's a lot of steps to take and things to do. Uh, and here is where we are at the moment. Okay, so the plan of the rest of the talk is going to be to explain the results and the, and the steps we've been taking. Uh, in order to motivate uh, the things we did, uh, I'm going to need to first explain the trace method, so the method which is used to study the problem, because otherwise, um, if I tell you the results, you won't see the link with the question. So I'm going to explain the trace method and how to use it to solve the problem. And then in the second part, I'm going to explain our results and present them. And the last two parts are going to be uh, explanations about how to actually prove the things. So I'm going to enter a bit into the proofs of our results. Um, okay, so let's talk about the trace method. Uh, tiny, tiny, oh, is that the last version of my slide? That's terrible. Oh, uh, well, it's okay. Uh, okay, so first I'm going to explain uh, the trace method. The, Idea in the trace method is to transform a spectral question. So here our question is, what is lambda one? And to make it into a geometric question. Um, and because the geometric question is going to be actually easier to solve. Uh, in order to do that, we use the Selberg trace formula. 
And what's great is that then understanding what lambda one, the spectral gap is, is going to amount to have information about the distribution of the length of all closed geodesics on my surface. So I'm going to explain that in a bit more detail. And my little disclaimer is supposed to be that throughout uh, this explanation, there's like epsilons missing in the exponents. There's big O's, which are not really, uh, I'm, I'm forgetting some logarithmic terms in big O's and stuff like that, because I want it to be as clear as possible. So don't take anything I say in this explanation as being formal. It's more of an informal discussion about how the terms are and things like that. All right. So um, in order to state the trace formula, I need to take a test function. And for our purposes, what we're going to take is fix a length. So L is a size. It's um, a length scale at which I look my surf at my surface. And I'm just going to fix a, te a test function H and rescale it. So I obtain HL, which is a rescaled version of H, just by the simple usual rescaling. Another thing which is important is uh, that when we write the Selberg trace formula, we always write the spectrum, the lambda j's, as one quarter plus rj squared. And here, rj's are therefore complex numbers. So it's going to, it's very important in order to state the formula, to state it in terms of the rj's and not in terms of the lambda j's. So one thing which is striking with this rewriting is that um, eigenvalues under one quarter and above one quarter are treated differently. See? Um, we always have that R naught is imaginary, purely imaginary, and is I over two because lambda naught is zero. The eigenvalues, some of them are going to lie between zero and I over two on the imaginary axis. These are the eigenvalues under one quarter, and the ones above one quarter are going to lie on the real axis. And uh, this makes them really, you can really tell that there is a difference between them. So our objective is to show that lambda one is not on the, that R one is not on the imaginary axis. And so I'm, the spectral, form, uh, the cell vector formula has two sides. It's an equality. Uh, it's a very precise equality. And I'm sorry for the dot, dot, dots. I just decided to hide some terms. The terms I hid are terms which are very explicit, simple to understand and will not change anything to our discussions. So I just didn't write them, but they are actually simple. It's not that they cause a problem. And But the two terms I want us to focus about is on one side, there's a spectral side, which is a sum on the spectrum. So it's a sum of the Fourier transform of H applied to the RJs. And on the other side, I have a sum, which is a geometric sum, because it runs over all closed geodesics. And here I have my test function H, L, applied to the length of gamma. L gamma is the length of the closed geodesic. So I have one side, which is a sum on all the spectrum, and one side, which is a sum of all the lengths of all the geodesics. Here is the sum of a primitive geodesics. The non-primitive ones are in the dot, 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 for people who know this formula. Um, okay, so um, the uh, one thing I wanted to say is that this the relationship is quite intricate between the spectrum and the geodesics because there's a Fourier transform. For, on one side, there's H hat, and on the other side, there's H. So because of the incident principle and things like that, there's really a bit of playing to be doing uh, on how changing H will affect changing H hat and things like that. So the cell back trace formula is quite an intricate relationship between the spectrum and the geometry. So let's look a bit more in detail. So the left side, the spectral side, is just a sum of, a, of all the H hat of R J. So the first term, oh, sorry, just a second, because this is actually my old slide, so I don't like that. Um, okay, so the first term is always going to be the biggest term, and the reason for that is that it's h hat applied to i over 2, 
And it's this is always going to behave like exponential of L over two when L is large. And we can see that because there's a Fourier transform, but we apply the Fourier transform at an imaginary number. So the exponential, which is supposed to be oscillatory, is actually going to not be oscillatory, but a hyperbolic cosine. So here, uh, rather than getting HL integrated against an oscillatory function, we get it integrated against a growing exponential. And the rate of this exponential is basically big L over two. So the leading term of the selberg trace formula in this regime is always going to correspond to the trivial eigenvalue and have a rate to growth of exponential L over two. And then if we look at it the same way for the second term, I have the spectral gap that appears here. I have H hat applied to R1. So that's where I'm going to see my lambda one. And this will always be the second order term. And uh, what's very interesting uh, and which, what we're gonna use is the fact that this second order term behaves like exponential of alpha L if lambda one is one quarter minus alpha squared, meaning it's smaller than one quarter. So this term is going to be exponential and the rate in the exponential, the alpha here, is related to how far away lambda one is from one quarter. If we look again at the little picture above, you see that the more close R1 is to R0, to the trigon eigenvalue, the bigger the imaginary part. So the bigger the um, uh, Fourier transform of H will be. And to the contrary, if we go further away, R1 goes close to zero, we get still some exponential contributions, but they grow less fast. So eigenvalues close to zero have big second term, and the further the eigenvalue away, is away from zero, the less big the second term is. So it really measures how big lambda one is. And as soon as lambda one is exponential, now uh, R1 is going to lie on the real axis. So when you integrate it, you're gonna have an oscillatory integration of HL. So you're gonna have terms which are no longer exponential in terms of um, L. So you can really see that whether lambda one is bigger or smaller than one quarter can be seen in the second order term. And then as we don't care about lambda two, et cetera, we don't care about the other terms here. So actually you can play uh, with this formula and convince yourself that we can reformulate our question, which was to prove that lambda one is bounded away from one quarter with high probability. So here I'm going to say that we want to prove that the probability for lambda one to be at least one quarter minus alpha squared goes to one when g goes to infinity. This can be, thanks to this trace method, reformulated in proving that the expectation of the geometric term, so this sum of all closed geodesic of this quantity that appears here, which is very explicit, is equal to the term corresponding to the trivial eigenvalue, which is always going to be here, um, which is h hat of i over two, plus something which is smaller when g goes to infinity. Smaller corresponds to the fact that we're looking for a limit here of exponential alpha l. So proving what, if we prove this geometric formula, we obtain a probabilistic bound on lambda one. Here, uh, alpha is a free parameter you could pick any fixed value of alpha you want. And actually, the different proofs, the 316, for instance, or our 29, correspond to taking different values of alpha. I'll make that explicit a bit later. Uh, so on the left side, it's very clear that we want to take alpha small. If we want to, if we take alpha very small, we correspond to proving one quarter minus epsilon, with epsilon very small. On the right side, now it's a bit clearer why alpha small makes it more difficult. Here, the smaller, if you replace alpha by a smaller value, it means you need to make a better estimate. The decay needs to be faster. 
So it requires you to redo your estimates with a higher degree of precision and to prove that things decay even faster. So when you pick your alpha, the smaller alpha gives you a better spectral result, but you will need to work more to obtain it and to get better bounds everywhere. And this is the spite which makes it incrementally, incrementally harder to get close to one quarter. And this is why we got 316. The uh, Wushwe and Lipnowski right got 316. And we then got to ninth. And we're hoping to get as close as we can to one quarter. Or to one quarter, actually. So up, up until here, up until this slide, this whole discussion is the same, exactly the same, uh, for the 316 paper and our paper. There is one uh, very different thing in our method, which is that we found a way to generate some cancellations, um, which makes uh, quite a big, uh, which is quite systematic and makes it very optimistic for the one quarter, uh, which which is a very uh, reasonable, we believe, approach to solving all the way to one quarter. The problem we try to address, and the reason why we need this consolation argument is that you can try and remember like when you were maybe in a, um, in second year undergrad or something like that, and you had a series and you needed to to prove it converges to, I don't know, 12. Uh, and then you needed to show that it converges to 12 with a decay with a second term 1 over n, and then you need to prove even better and to improve everything. Well, when you want to prove that something converges to 12, you're going to have to find where this 12 comes from. Often, you're going to take the 12 and you're going to put it on the left-hand side and you're going to subtract it to your series or your sequence and try to make something happen so that it's no longer there. And then you want to prove that something decays to zero as fast as you want. It's a bit hard to show that something converges to 12 as fast as you want without finding a way to put the 12 on the left-hand side and kind of cleaning, making it work with something. Here, it's really annoying because we have this term corresponding to the trivial eigenvalue, which we know is a really big term. It's actually the leading term. And we want to understand the sub, the, the, the correction to this leading term, the subdominant uh, term. So this is not very nice. And uh, we really actually rather <laughs> this term wasn't there. For the 316, actually, there's a really beautiful argument which works really well, which makes you not worry about that. But uh, it's really hard to see how this would work further uh, than 316. So rather than hoping to find some magical cancellation or something, we have a bit of a systematic approach to address this problem. And the idea is to, rather than applying the trace formula to HL, we differentiate HL. So we so HL is just a function of one variable. And we apply this, diff, this derivation operator. So one quarter minus derivative squared to the power m. So we derivate up to 2m times the, the HL. And due to Fourier analysis, because of the derivation properties of Fourier transform, this corresponds to replacing HL hat by one quarter plus r squared to the power m HL hat. So we multiply by this polynomial, which has a zero of order m at i over two. So what's great is that i over two is the trivial eigenvalue. So what I mean by that is that this term I want to remove is actually no longer here. It's equal to zero. So now, rather than proving this initial geometry question, we have another one. We want to show that if we differentiate enough, if we take m to be large enough, this expectation here decays as fast as we can, as we want. So we want to show that for every alpha, there is an m such that uh, this thing decays like exponential alpha l. So this is a way to deal with the trivial eigenvalue. And it's going to be quite important, and you're going to see that in just a few minutes. Uh, OK. So now, uh, so now I try to explain to you 
why we care about this geometric question. If you if you if you're a geometer and you don't care about the spectral question, you can decide you want to care about the geometric question. We don't really need to remember for now about the spectral question. Here, I just wanted to motivate why do we want to study these averages. So now our objective in the paper is to develop new tools to compute and to estimate expectations. So I guess I didn't say that this E here, by that I mean the expectation from our random model, so the average. And we need to be able to compute the average, or estimate it at least, of the sum of all closed geodesics of a certain function f. So f is, go, is, is the, I'm going to apply it to the thing which is here in the expectation, but I don't want to think about that. So, but I want for a general F to be able to understand this expectation. The first step is to understand that this can be seen as a density. So we can actually write this expectation as an integral of the test function F times a certain density. And in a sense, the density is the proportion of hyperbolic surfaces of genus G, which have a geodesic of length precisely L. And this is completely a trivial statement. It's a very simple lemma of measure theory. The idea is just if you're integrating something, you can just cut your the place of so here we use so okay. So here my potato is the set of all hyperbolic surfaces of genus G. And I have a nice measure on it, a density Lebesgue-like measure on it. And what I'm saying is I'm just cutting it in layers. Uh, on each layer is a level set on which a length of a certain geodesic is constant. And what I say is that I can, rather than integrate F of L gamma on the whole set, I can rather integrate it on each level line and then change the level line. So the density that appears is the size of each of these level sets. In other words, if we look at the expectation up, at, up here, f of l is going to appear as much as there are surfaces which have a length gamma, a length l geodesic inside. So that's how many times um, f of l will be sampled. Phi of phi of phi, phi g of o of l is how many times f of l will be seen in this expectation. And actually, I'm going to explain what kind of things we want to prove on uh, this density function. Uh, our problem can actually be reduced to understanding very, very well this density function. And the reason for that is that this writing as an integral interacts very well with the trace method we developed. And um, the, because now we are studying integrals, so we can do analysis. So I wanted to study this ugly sum, the expectation of this ugly sum, and it's an expectation on, on a weird set. I don't really want to study that. But actually, what this rewriting tells us is that it's an integral. And it's just an integral of the thing we're trying to average times the weight function, uh, so the density function, psi g o. But now it's an integral, so I can do an integration by parts and take this uh, differential operator here and apply it on the uh, other side. So this is an integration by parts. The dot, dot, dot term is the boundary terms, which don't matter to us. And now uh, what I want to prove, actually, is that this thing that appears, so this differential operator applied to this density function is small. That's going to be my new objective. If I manage to do that, then this whole integral will be small and I won. Because I want to prove the, exp the expectation is small. So if I prove that this thing is small, it's going to be small. More precisely, uh, we introduce a notion of friedman ramanujan function. Which, which is analogous to Friedman's notion of Ramanujan function. So that's how where the name comes from. And uh, we say that the function is a Friedman Ramanujan function if it is equal to a leading term, which is a polynomial in L times exponential of L. So it's really important the leading term is a polynomial 
in L times an exponential of L, precisely L. And then there's a subleading term, I mean the rest, the remainder has a growth rate which is at most polynomial times exponential L over two. So here, the gap in exponents between the exponential L and the exponential L over two is exactly the gap between the trivial eigenvalue zero and the optimal spectral gap one quarter. The fact that there's a gap here in the exponents is really not a coincidence with regards to that. Uh, okay, so that's just a definition, a very simple definition. So I'm studying a class of functions which are of this form. And uh, the cute uh, observation, cute but naive, is that if I was to prove that uh, the density psi g times l, it doesn't, you can ignore the l, it's just a technical thing. If I was to prove that my density friend is a Friedman Ramanujan function, then you can check that uh, the main term, polynomial times exponential, if you replace if you replace it, multiply it by exponential L over two, you're going to get polynomial time exponential L over two. And then if you derivate this enough times, if you apply one quarter minus d square m enough times, more than the degree of the polynomial, this is equal to zero. So the main term gets cancelled, completely fully cancelled by the application of this. Um, of the operator one quarter minus d squared to the power m. Uh, and this is really because polynomial time exponential L over two is a solution of this operator uh, applied to a function equals zero. This is just a simple ODE, and these are some of its solutions. So, th in a, so this means that uh, we really have a concrete way uh, of killing the contributions of the trivial eigenvalue. And if we want, if we manage to prove that, then as a corollary, very simple, we get the one quarter conjecture, but sadly we also get that one equals zero because we get two very, very good one quarter conjecture like poof, uh, no surfaces have a small lambda one, everything is perfect. And so th this is naive, we can't prove that it will prove it would imply things which are better than the truth. But if we were to prove that, it would imply the one quarter conjecture. Uh, okay. So this is a good uh, ob objective to, if we, we would like to prove. So now the reason why, uh, one of the things which helped for the free 16 result uh, is that we know how this density looks like at the first order. And this is a key argument in both of the proofs of the 316 result. Uh, so we actually have something very explicit, uh, which is not obvious at all to prove. It's a tech very quite technical to get precisely this statement I wrote. Um, we have that the main term of uh, the density, psi g o, is 4 over L hyperbolic sine square of L over 2. And by main term, I mean that the uh, we have a one over G decay uh, in the remainder. I put it tilt because it's approximately big O, but what matters is this size. Uh, so this is the leading order in the terms of, remember we're in the large genus asymptotic. So here I have a one over G decay. So it, it is in that sense that this is the leading order. And so, oh, the reason why we can compute this leading term is that it comes from the contribution of simple closed geodesic. So a geodesic is simple if it doesn't have any self-intersections. So on the left-hand side here, I have a surface with two simple geodesics. They don't have any self-intersection. And to the contrary, on the right-hand side, this is not a simple geodesic because it self-intersects. And so what you can prove and what Wushui proved in their proof, actually, is that at the first order, only simple geodesics matter. And luckily, we Mirzakani developed uh, very good tools which allow you to compute explicitly what happens for simple closed geodesics. So a little sanity check here. 
is that uh, remember we wanted to prove that L times CJO of L was Friedman Ramanuja. Well, here, if we multiply by L, you get four hyperbolic sine square of L over two, which is exponential of L plus something which is bounded actually. And so this is a Friedman Ramanujan function. We said we want the polynomial here is one. So at the first order, uh, CJO is Friedman Ramanujan. The whole function won't be, but the first order is. And so um, I told you that the reason for the 316 is that we study the leading term. And this is actually a, a, a game you can play with the parameters. You can have fun and uh, uh, understand how the parameters, uh, so the, the big L, the G, the alpha, all, all these guys, how they work together and convince yourself that for any order of precision, you get a new understanding of psi G O, meaning, so the first order is I have an error decaying in one of a G, the second order in one of a G square, et cetera, the better you get, the smaller you are able to take your alpha in the trace methods, meaning the better spectral gaps you're able to obtain. So um, in uh, Wushwe and Lipnowski writes, they have errors one over G, which lead to their 316 result. In our current paper, we understand everything up to decay one over G squared, which allows us to prove that lambda one is greater than two nine minus epsilon. And in order to reach one quarter minus epsilon, we need to have to do all the computations with arbitrary high precision. So we need the error term to be one over j to the power k for arbitrary high k. And the bigger k is, the closer to one quarter I get. And uh, we prove partial results uh, for bigger terms in our current paper. Uh, and the general case of several of the results I mentioned will be addressed in the second paper, which is currently in writing. And we hope to have uh, to put on the archive within the year, but not uh, like just now, but uh, we're already uh, in quite a good uh, level of understanding. Okay, so here are the results, finally. Uh, so the first result is that um, the density function, so my friend psi j o, has an asymptotic expansion. So meaning that I can go past this first order thing and actually write it as a sum of, of one over j to the power k times some functions, which now are independent on g and they just depend on l. And the remainder has better and better decay. So that's not a, too difficult. It's just a matter of defining everything very well, which uh, needed to be done, actually. We have to define a lot of um, things in the article to deal. Uh, OK, I'll say in a sec. So the second point is a bit can be a bit seen in parallel to just written above. I wrote that the first term we can compute because it comes from simple closed geodesics. Well, when you go higher, when you want more terms, you, it won't be enough to only look at simple closed geodesics, and you will need to understand more topologies. But we show that if you want to understand the kth term, so fk, or you can write it as a sum over some t's. So t for me is a local type. It's a kind of way the curve is. Uh, I'll explain vaguely. And it's a sum of all the types of complexity under a certain k, under this k. So the only curve of complexity, the only local type of complexity zero is the type simple, corresponding to the simple curve. And that's why in order to compute f naught o, we only need to look at simple geodesics. But when you want to compute f1, there's more geodesics that appear, and meaning all the geodesics of complexity one. In these simple examples I drew on the right-hand side, the complexity is basically the number of intersections. So if I look at this eight shape, it has one self-intersection, so it has complexity one. So it will appear in every term starting with F1. And then there's a double eight, uh, which has complexity two. So it will only start appearing in F2. 
And actually, uh, we won't have to bother about it for the 29, but we will have to bother about it for the one code. This is a way to write explicitly FKO because we can abstractly prove that there's an asymptotic expansion, but that's not very useful. We want to be able to compute the terms. So the point B here is that we can compute the terms and there are sums of a, a certain finite number of topologies that we can consider. And we can really have a hierarchy of how precisely in order to get to a certain precision, we only need to look at these curves. Another result we prove is that for all type of complexity, smaller or equal to one, um, all the terms are friedman ramanujan functions. So all those FKT coming from the different types uh, are friedman ramanujan functions. So this is quite exciting because I explained to you that when you're a friedman ramanujan function and you get plugged into the trace methods, there's cancellations which occur. So uh, we're going to be able to use these cancellations to prove the one quarter conjecture, or well, at least that's the hope. And uh, so this is actually the aim, the, 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 the result that we are uh, writing in the follow-up paper is to prove that without the restriction to complexity smaller than one. The next paper is a proof for any complexity. And um, so the last point is that actually, so if now you want to look at F1 or, it, you can write there's the sum of uh, co types of complexity smaller than one of these little F1t. And even though all those terms are friedman ramanujan the overall sum of them is not. We prove that in uh, our article. So that's uh, actually something which also happens in Friedman's proof of Allen's conjecture. There's a place where things start to get a bit. So whilst F0 is very nice and Friedman Ramanujan, when you go at F1 already, things break down and the sum of all types of all the F1 is not going to be Friedman Ramanujan. And this is the reason why the hope to prove that the whole density is Friedman Ramanujan is too optimistic. It's actually not true. And we actually already see that at the, le of, at the level of F1. So I'll explain a tiny bit about the proof at the end if I have the time. Okay, so that's our results of this paper. Um, and we use this to obtain that the spectral gap is to nine minus epsilon. So now I'm going to explain uh, a bit the first three points, the kind of ideas that appear a, a bit informally. And um, so I'm going to first talk about when you're trying to compute the sum of a simple geodesics. So you're computing the same expectation as before, but rather than summing over all geodesics, you're summing just above simple geodesics. And similarly to the sum of every single geodesic, there's a density, Psi simple, that's why the other one was psi all. If you some only of a simple ones, you get this density. And uh, Mirazakani provided a way to describe this density and compute it precisely. And the idea is to uh, construct a random surface of genus G containing a simple geodesic of length L. So CIG simple is the proportion of, of um, surfaces containing a geodesic of length L. So in a sense, it's going to be equal to how many random, random surfaces have a geodesic of length L divided by how many random surfaces exist in total. And so we, we create a way to construct random surfaces that have a geodesic of length L to understand how this numerator here looks like. So here is a simple geodesic of length L. And what I want to do is I want to create a surface around it in which there's going to be my geodesic of length L. This way, I'm sure that there's a geodesic of length L in my surface. And to do that, for instance, I can pick a random surface of genus one with about one boundary component of length L and glue it on one side. And I can pick a random surface of genus G minus one with one boundary component of length L. And I can pick a random way of gluing these two surfaces together. And this gives me 
a random surface, once I glue these two pieces, and it's always going to contain a geodesic of length precisely L. There's a few other possibilities. I could have put uh, G minus two on one side and G minus two on the other side or things like that, but you enumerate all the possible cases. And then you see that there's a way to generate every single hyperbolic surface of genus G with a geodesic of length L, and it gives you a formula for the density. And the formula is, it can, is in terms of the total volumes of those sets of random hyperbolic surfaces that I didn't really tell you anything about, sadly. We have studied in our previous paper with Nalini uh, these quantities that appear in this density and provided an asymptotic expansion for them. And basically what we know is that if we look at the dependency of, on L, on the number of possibilities for what to glue on the left and also what to glue on the right, both of these things are going to look like polynomial times exponential over two plus something which is polynomial. And so it's you're going to have that many possibilities for what happens on the left and that many possibilities for what happens on the right. And so this should ring a bell a tiny bit, the shape of these uh, formulas. And actually, when you multiply these two, because you, you have to pick one random surface on the left and one random surface on the right, so you have to multiply the number of possibilities on each side, ta you get um, the total number of possibilities behaving like a polynomial time exponential plus a remainder, which is polynomial time exponential over two which is exactly the definition of friedman ramanujan functions. And so this is why the density, all the terms of the asymptotic expansion of the density for simple geodesics, but by uh, psi g simple, they're all friedman ramanujan thanks to this argument. But now we want to look at more complicated topologies because if we want to look at better terms, better orders of precision, we need to deal with them. And the problem is that all these methods developed by Mirzakani, they only work for simple geodesics. And uh, that's kind of the work we do in this paper that we're about to release. Uh, we extend many of the tools and provide methods and definitions because there wasn't any, any definitions even to deal with non-simple geodesics, which is absolutely essential for the one quarter conjecture. I'm going to present things in the simplest possible case, which is the case of the figure eight, but actually uh, things do get hairy, like it's very complicated. There's many different curves to look at, and that's why many cases are postponed to the second article, which is in writing, because it's quite technical, actually. But we also already defined a lot of notions and prove a lot of results for any geodesic, not just eights and curves of complexity one. Okay. The reason why Mirzakani stuff doesn't work that well is that this is a little figure eight that drew here. And now I can't just say I'm going to take a surface with the boundary in the shape of a figure eight and glue it, and another surface with the boundary of the shape of a figure eight and glue it. These surfaces are not really surfaces with a boundary. So it's not going to work to, to just glue some pieces directly to the curve. Rather than that, I'm going to have to draw the curve on a little piece of paper and say, OK, this is what the neighborhood of the curve looks like. The curve looks like this in a little piece, uh, which is the smallest possible thing in which I can embed it. And here for the figure eight, this is a pair of pants. Uh, the smallest thing on which I can draw a pair of uh, eight is a pair of pants. So it's a surface with three boundary components. And uh, if I know L1, L2, and L3, I know L. Uh, there is this formula relating those four lengths. So now, rather than having just to draw my um, simple curve unambiguously, I have to say that my, my eight lives in a pair of pants. And I have to pick three values, L1, L2, and L3, for the three boundary components of this pair of pants. And they live on a set of dimension two because I have to make sure that the length of gamma is L, precisely L. So this, you need to sample something on the set of level of, of uh, dimension two. 
And now I can do exactly like before. And I can say, okay, I need to glue something to each of these boundary geodesics. And I reuse, we reuse the result uh, of our previous paper. And it's exactly the same for every one of these little components. The number of possibilities has exactly the same shape as before. It's, I'm really using the same results. Except before, I was just saying, I have this number on one side and this number on the other side, and I multiply them. And now uh, it's a bit more complicated. Actually, what I end up having to do is integrate products of these three functions because I have the number of possibilities is the product of the number of possibilities for each thing. And I integrate that on the set of parameters L1, L2, and L3 for which this uh, formula holds. So I have a weight level set uh, and I need to integrate these functions on this weird level set. And this is quite a pain, to be honest, uh, but we actually prove that uh, any such integral is a friedman ramanujan function. But see, it's a lot more hard than to say that the product of any of those two things is friedman ramanujan And this is uh, the kind of arguments we use to deal with the non-simple curves and the sort of challenges which appear. And here is really the simplest possible case. Sadly, it does get more complicated, uh, substantially more complicated with more topologies. Okay, so I think I uh, won't linger too much on this last part. It was more of a, a vague um, explanation. Uh, I mean, because, uh, okay, I'll just go for it. Um, Last to conclude, I'm going to talk briefly about tangles and why they matter. So tangles have been actually introduced uh, by myself and my collaborator in an article a few years back, and also simultaneously by Lipnowski and writing there on proof of the 316 result. And the tangle is uh, a small pair of pants or a small one sole torus in the surface. So see here small, by that I mean that the yellow curves are short, so it's a small piece of the surface which could easily be removed. And um, so there's a similar notion for graphs, which also appears in this setting. And if you remember the very first thing I said at the beginning of the talk, if the surface is not very well connected, lambda one is small. So here a tangle is a little piece of the surface I can really easily remove. So it is related to having a small lambda one. This is quite bad. You, you don't want that in your surface. Tangles are related to small eigenvalues. And that's why they're bothers. And actually, we prove that in, in uh, our uh, um, soon to be coming article, that the probability for lambda one to be very small is about the probability of containing a tangle. And the way this depends on G is one over G. And we also prove, on the other hand, that if the density function uh, psi g o, if it's first term, sorry, second order term, so the f1, was friedman ramanujan then we would be able to prove a bound on the probability of having a fairly small eigenvalue, which has decay 1 over j to the power 5 quarter. 5 quarter is bigger than 1. So this uh, contradicts the first statement. It goes to zero too fast, better than what is actually happening. And therefore, F1 all cannot be a friedman ramanujan function. And uh, it's really because if it was, we'd be able to prove something that is better than true. We'd be able to prove that those tangles up here don't happen a lot. They happen very rarely even though we know that they do happen. So it would be a contradiction. And there's a very good reason for this seemingly contradictory statement. So it's a bit strange uh, what I told you. I told you that F1 O is not friedman ramanujan and it's a sum. And I told you that all the terms are friedman ramanujan So it seems a bit odd. Uh, but the reason for that is that there's actually many, many types of complexity one. There's only one type of complexity, zero, simple curves. But when you look at the type one, or types of complexity one, there's many, many curves. And errors add up if there's a tangle. 
indeed. And if you take a tangle in your surface, so a pair of points with a short boundary, any geodesic on uh, the pair of points of length up to L is going to contribute. Uh, it's going. To, they're all going to have complexity one because they all live in a pair of points. And it's really easy to argue that the number of such curves is exponential of L over L. It grows exponentially fast. So the number of types we need to compute F1O grows exponentially in L. So even though, so, so, so if now you wrote the fact that all these F1T are friedman ramanujan you will get all these big O's of L over 2, but you have a sum which has an exponential number of terms. So you won't get that the of a small sum has exponential decay, L over 2. It's going to grow faster than L over 2. And hence, uh, this is why it's not really contradictory that every single one of these individual terms are not uh, half remember managing, and the sum is not. The reason is really because there's too many geodesics in a tangle. When you have a tangle, there's exponentially many geodesics. Sorry, you, when there's a tangle, there's exponentially many types to compute, and that's too many. And this problem is actually already present in both proofs of the 316s result and is reason for 95% of the effort in both these papers. And it's fixed in two completely different approaches, which uh, I find very interesting and complementary. Um, in one case, uh, Wushui prove that actually they actually don't matter if you want to prove 316, because yes, there's exponentially many tangles, but this there's not too many tangles and kind of actually doesn't matter. But what we prove is past 316, they do matter. And Lipnowski and Wright removed the tangles by multiplying by an indicator function, uh, the trace formula. The problem is that it breaks everything because you can't really multiply uh, all the methods rely on integrating over the whole moduli space, over the whole space of surfaces. And if you add an indicator function, you add some technical things to deal with. And so in our proof of the two-ninth spectral gap, we actually use all of our results of the first paper uh, that we are about to release, plus we interest counting results plus an adaptation of the inclusion-exclusion by Lipnowski and Wright, which is much harder, much, much, much more hard um, here for the two nine, but it allows us to remove the tangles and we obtain this result. And in order to go to beyond two nine, we have to improve this inclusion-exclusion bit. We were really quite lucky because to get the two nine, it's kind of where things, uh, we were in the soft spot of having not too many cases to consider, but further you go, the more messy it becomes. Uh, but uh, we are very happy because we now understand uh, Friedman's argument in the case of graphs, and we believe we can understand how to adapt it to the case of surface. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, uh, Laura, for this uh, talk. Uh, we have uh, maybe some time for some questions. Uh... At this point, so if you have questions, please unmute yourself or ask them in chat. Yes, I have a question. Uh, uh, do, do you know if for a fixed genus, uh, it exists a uh, Riemann surface with a lambda one equal one quarter? Uh, so Is we have examples or? for small surface for small genus, for instance, the. Yeah. For genus two, there's a surface with lambda one, like three point something. Okay. But then, uh, if you want to have large genus, it's quite yeah. difficult. Uh, yeah. 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 There is a minus epsilon in the existence results. Okay. If you fix the genus, uh, you can look at the probability that uh, lambda one is greater than one quarter minus epsilon. Do you have estimates for fixed genus for that using the same kind of uh, so, so yeah the so here the fact of taking genus going to infinity helps us a lot actually yeah, yeah I understand so <laughs> if you if you yeah if you don't have that actually it's a lot harder a priori yeah. 
And you can't yeah. really say much. But because in you principle, don't have to... you can uh, use a Zellberg in the same way. Yes, yes, that's true. You could okay. try to make everything very quantitative, but the problem is that you need to look at longer and longer geodetics. Yeah. And in order to know something about them, you need your surface to be bigger and bigger. Because if yeah. the surface is fixed of fixed yeah. genus, then you look at longer and longer geodetics, so they can do worse and worse things. And yeah. here we have a soft spot where we look um, when the surface grows at the same time, so we actually are able to know what the geodesic does inside of it. Uh -huh. So that's really why we need to have yeah, G go okay. into infinity. Okay, okay. I understand. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your talk. It was very nice. Thanks, uh, Eva, for the question. Do we have other uh, questions for Laura? Yeah, I've got a question. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And thanks for the talk, by the way. Uh, so the um, Mirza Khani uh, had this function uh, that she got, which is basically the the volume of the the Thurston Norn ball and the space of uh, measured geodesic laminations. When you consider um, higher topological types of curves, do you get any kind of analog for this this Mirza Khani function, this B of X? So here B of X doesn't appear at all for this. Uh, so Mirzakhan, you really had two different hats in counting of geodesics. So <laughs> you can either pick the surface and look at long geodesics. And here there's this B of X that appear and there's mm -hmm. these measured laminations and these lattice counting arguments. And there's the hat uh, here, which is to look at kind of a fixed length scale, but longer and uh, bigger and bigger surfaces. And here it's more like topological recursion formulas that happen. And things like that, which don't involve the B of X and are really quite orthogonal, actually. Uh, uh, a lot of people do only one and not the other because the ways and the approaches and everything are very different. I see. Okay, thank you. Thanks, uh, Hunter, for the intervention. Are there other questions for uh for... I, have, I have one more specific one. Oh, um, oh yeah, yeah, go on. Sure. Uh, the, uh, for the, the figure eight, um, curve, um, you had to randomly sample the, the links um, on the pair of pants. What was the distribution of the links? Was it just like, um, was it just like a partition of the total length or, or was so you it? Have, um, you have R3, which is just picking the free, I mean, R plus three, which is picking the free lengths. And then you cut it in level sets, depending on the length of the geodesic you will get. And you get, you take the measure induced by Lebeck on these level sets. Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, do we have uh, maybe time for one other question? For the case of a uh, graph, uh, uh, I mean, the case of regular graph, do mm -hmm. people use also a trace formula? Or? Yes, so the method is really similar. Um, okay. Similarly, you have like, you need to cancel the trivial eigenvalue and it it makes yeah. you want to prove things are Freeman Ramanujan and in the trace formula, and it's really quite similar. Okay. So you're counting uh, paths, which are actually not really geodesics, so you, you can go back and forth uh, on yeah. your random graphs rather than geodesics. Yeah, but, uh, your random unless you, you fix uh, the degree and the number of vertices. Yeah. And the degree is fixed and the number of uh, Vertices so the degree is a bit like the curvature, like the minus one, okay. and the number of vertices, like the genus, like the size. Okay. And so the exponential L, which is the rate of growth of poles in the hyperbolic plane, is going to be um, mm -hmm. powers of D, because mm -hmm. balls in the infinite tree uh, okay. grow like D to the power okay. of the, the radius. Okay. So they count the number of closed uh, curves in the, in the graph, something like yeah. that. Exactly. You want to prove same asymptotic expansions and prove that all the terms are Friedman Ramanujan okay. or Ramanujan in this case. Okay. And there is something uh, similar to Mirzakami decomposition or uh, it's in, So this aspect is much easier for graphs because for instance, if you look at the eighth, I was explaining that the problem here is that you have this weird level integration yeah. uh, on this weird set of values for L1, mm -hmm. L2 and L3. Whilst for graphs, it's just a simple convolution because yeah. if you look at the eight on the graph, you can just say it's the sum of two paths. Yeah. So you're just integrating it over L1 plus L2 equal L mm -hmm. rather than these L1, L2, L3 with this weird condition relating them. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. So it's a bit easier for that math. Okay. And what is called a Ramanujan graph correspond to one quarter exactly? Exactly, yeah. And okay. um, so even for graphs, it's quite hard to prove uh, yeah, I know to that. understand <laughs> <laughs> like um, how lambda one is related to one quarter and how it's distributed. There's been some great breakthroughs recently. But they, uh, if you want to have very fine information about lambda one, you need to use something else than the trace method. It's quite limited, actually. And mm. it's things we really can't deal with at the moment for random surfaces. So thank you. Thanks a lot for uh, this question. Um, so I, I think uh, you can all join me in thanking uh, Laura again for this uh, very nice talk. And uh, we'll join again next week for a talk by uh, Shai Sakansani. The